big pace is 330, very specifically, 330 milliseconds after the A sense. Because we know if we're at 330, we're going to capture, right? We're going <laughs> to capture the HM. And then at that point, we've broken the PMT. So the A pace, by V pace, this is captured, this can't go retrograde, PMT is done, okay? So sometimes, particularly with by V devices, you don't want to fix the reason for the PMT. So, and this is a situation where you just let the PMT detection algorithm work it out, right? Because if you make the PVOP long, you will pull the max track around to, down to a low level, okay? Uh, you can put a magnet on and this, yeah, magnet will stop it. Yeah, the problem is the patient's at home, going, like this. So, this, so these are always on, these termination algorithms are always on, and they work really well, okay? So, so when you see these, if you can fix it and stop it happening, you should do, but don't compromise other aspects of the device functionality. Okay? And this would be an example when, when you would, uh, if, you, if you made a change, you'd probably compromise the device a little bit. Okay. This is a, another uh, apparent PMT. This device says it's a PMT, look, PMT. So it's good to find out why it happened. So we'll, we'll, we'll do the storybook again. So A, B, A pace by B, capturing. Capture, 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 no problem, and then this happens. A sense, by V pace, is that retrograde conduction? Is that retrograde conduction? No. Highly unlikely. It's, well, likely possible, really. There's lots of EPs here, right? Yeah? If you've just, if your HM's just depolarized and then you've placed your ventricle, you're not going to retrograde and conduct it. We need dissociation, right? So this is not retrograde conduction. It's just a PAC, right? Just an atrial ectopic. That's all. Just a boring little atrial ectopic. I think sometimes when we look at device traces, we try to find the most complicated thing we can find. Really complicated. So, so in, 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 over in the UK, we call that looking for unicorns, right? So, you know, if you see hoof prints in the... In, you don't have snow here much, but in, we do it back up. Sand. In the sand. So you see hoof prints in the sand. Mm, what animal walked down the road that night? It's a unicorn. It's a unicorn. No, it's not. It's a horse. It's just a horse or a donkey, right? But everyone in the UK, they look for the hoof. It's a unicorn. It must be a unicorn walking in, in the snow or in the sand, right? So they're not normally unicorns, right? So that A sense, is, is it tracked? Does that A sense get tracked? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's outside peel up, so it gets tracked. Did you, know, did you notice there's an extension of the AV delay? Why did the AV delay go long? Because it's, otherwise the ventricular rate would impinge upon the maximum tracking rate that we've set on this device, okay? Yeah? So this is pseudo winky back behavior, okay? So the, the upper tracking rate on this device, the device is not allowed to pace until here. It's not allowed to pace the ventricle, because you've told it, max tracking rate is uh, we, we can see the max, ma maximum tracking rate. So the maximum tracking rate is between here and here, right? We can work out this number here. That's the max, so that's uh, 80, 280, 480. It's about 110 beats per minute. Oops, that's bad. We should have tracked that properly, okay? And paste the ventricle here. But we didn't, we delayed it. So we delayed the ventricle, ventricle paste, then this happened. This is now retrograde, right? Sorry, you okay? Not retrograde. No, it is. This is retrograde. This is retrograde because we've delayed, but we've delayed this, we've really got a delay here in the, in the, it, so the last time the HM depolarized was 200, nearly 300 milliseconds ago. So we can go backwards now if we want, okay? So now we go, this here, this, this, this V pace makes the HM happen. This is outside PVAR and then off we go again, again with a long AV delay, yeah? Because we're not allowed to pace so soon because we didn't finish the upper tracking rate that we've programmed. So our devices come normally, max track on our CRTs at 110, made that higher. Make it 130, okay? Make it 120, 130, okay? So anyway, we go into a PMT, and patients in a PMT, 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 see the extension of the AV delay here? That's the test, yeah? That's the wiggle test, we call it the wiggle test. We wiggle out the V, and then watch if the A jumps with it. The A jumps with it, closes the PMT, blocks it with an A pace. PMT's over. How would you fix this? Right? It's 
close enough to the atrial tissue, okay? Because you can't control that. You can't control that APV, can you? It just happens whenever it wants. It's random, okay? You may still get a PMT if that timing slightly changes, but let's push our max, let's push this patient's max track out a little bit, okay? So some PMTs you can fix, some you can fix, but you don't want to fix. Let the algorithm pick it up, okay? Guess what? I think this is another PMT. It is. Got a few PMTs, with different types of PMTs. Right, so what do we see here? By V pace, A pace, A capture? Yeah. V capture? Yes. A pace, capture, by V, capture, and then this happens. Over on the A channel. So there, this A pace, then we get this here. And if we look, there is nothing on that atrial channel that you can see. Is it right? So sometimes people get annoyed and they say, right, well, it senses stuff and I can't see anything. And then they call the device stupid and say bad things to me and upset me. Sometimes I don't know. They, we've got noise, right? There's noise on that atrial lead. The resolution on this is lower than the resolution that the device is, is, is sensing out, okay? So you will, on reasonably rare occasions, see nothing on here, but the device has seen something, okay? It's just the resolution that you, we can't run the same resolution on a piece of paper, that the device can work out, okay? So there is a different resolution. So this is some form of over-sensing on the atrium. What could it be? EMI. This could be superiorly detected EMI. Yeah, absolutely. This could be potentially a fractured lead. Yeah. Highly unlikely, but it could be potentially a start of a fractured lead. This could be the first sign that there's a problem with this, with this atrial lead. Okay? <coughs> we don't know. We, we're going to have to wait and see a little bit and see what happens with this lead and just and watch it. It's all trending normally, thresholds are normal, everything's normal. Anyway, so the device sees this, it tracks it, it V paces. Last time the atrium depolarized was two, four, six, eight, one thousand milliseconds ago. Okay, now we can have retrograde conduction, okay? So V is asynchronous from the atrial chamber. Yeah, totally asynchronous. V goes up to A, A is outside PVAR, track it, off we go, okay? There is one other thing to notice here. When we, when we paste, what is this that stick here? Look, there's two atrial markers. That is far field R wave. So we have a far field R wave, so we have a far field R wave. So that's in the that's in the P VARP, and then this is outside P VARP. This is the one that gets tracked. PMT. We follow it to its natural conclusion. So, so that is the possibility of oversensitive. Pardon? Yeah. So that that makes the atrial lead oversensitive. Yeah. So the atrial lead is oversensing of noise and oversensing the far field R waves. So oversensing two things. Okay. What about negative EV hysteresis? One thousand ten by one hundred. This? It's for uh, where? So, once, for these numbers here, or this one? So, ne negative AV hysteresis can be helpful in some CRT patients if there's competition. Some, but not many. Okay? So, negative AV hysteresis will if it sees an R wave coming through, so you have to see an R wave coming through the AV node and then it paces shorter. Yeah? So this is, these numbers are varying. These are normal, this is the normal variance. You have a, like a plus or minus 5%, 10%, okay? This here, why is this gone, why is this gone so fast? 125, it's gone from 176 to 125. That's the rate response of AV delay, yeah? Rate response of AV delay. So if you go faster, you go shorter with the AV delay. It's physiological. It's what you lot do when you walk, yeah? Yeah, so this is just physiological. So this is just rate response of AV delay shortening. It's normal. Okay? The PMT continues, continues, continues until we do the wiggle there. So we extend a bit. It, the A jumps with it. We go, it's PMT. A pace, break PMT. Okay? So what you would do with that pace, make a patient. Well, just monitor the atrial lead. There's not much you can do, right? You can't. You, you wouldn't be programming atrial sensitivity because you don't know how big the signal is because you can't even see it. Okay, so it's a bit of a bit of an odd one, but it's the sort of stuff that sometimes happens. 
I think this might be my nearly. No, no, I've got one more after this. So this is another PMT. Let's have a look, see if we can work out why this happened. A sense capture. Uh, so A sense capture. A sense capture. A sense capture. Da 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 da. da. AV delays here of 125, 125, 125, 125. Then it goes to 273. VIP. It's VIPing, yeah? So it's a ventricular intrinsic preference. So it's a VIPing. A sense, VIP, long AV delay, then what happens? It's gone retrograde conducted because we're so far away from the atrial event. So AV extension algorithms can cause PMTs. Why not? If you separate far enough, why not? It's normal, it's, yeah? This patient then starts to conduct retrogradely. You're like, ah. So what are we going to do about this? Activate So activate the PMT algorithm and it terminates it. No problem. What's the risk now, though? Does another VIP? It'll, it'll do it again. This could do it again, right? This could do it again. It's done it once. Absolutely. That would be what I would do. That's what we did with this patient. We decreased the, the extension. And we did a quick test and made, and just checked whether this patient actually should be vipping. Right? Because so, this patient was getting kind of like 5% sensed activity. Okay. He's got AV block, right? Turn it off. Okay. Um, but interestingly, he does get, he's, got, he's got reasonably good, well, he's got quite, he hasn't got reasonably good, he's got very slow retrograde conduction. So you can have full third degree AV block, right? But have kind of retrograde conduction, no problem. It sometimes confuses people, but it happens. So, so in this patient here, this is, a, this is a time when you really want to be turning VIP off, okay? Or limiting how far it can go, how far it can extend out. And you can test that in clinic, right? You can get it extended out and see if you induce a PMT. But it kind of depends on circulating catecholamines and all this kind of carry on. But that's, so it's a little bit challenging. But yeah, device again, broke the PMT. So. That's an easy fix. ECG of a uh, dual chamber pacemaker. So this was when I worked in Australia for a little bit. And um, I got this ECG at, I think about 10 o'clock on a Saturday night. So I was out in central Sydney, out with some friends, having something to eat, having a couple of drinks. And a friend of mine said, phoned me up and says, I've got an ECG I need you to look at. I was like, okay, it's like 10 o'clock on a Saturday night and I'm not working. I'll send you the ECG. So, okay, I'll send, send the ECG. So this is a pacemaker patient, dual chamber pacemaker. He had this device put in um, about a year ago, year, year previous to this ECG. And he's turned up now in a clinic, in an in a, in a A&E hospital, an accident emergency uh, unit, in a hospital very far away into the, into, almost into the bush of Australia, right? Very far, far away. Huh? A switch lead, a dislodged atrial lead. So they 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 have a no, they, they were in the right holes and they were in the right chambers. We confirmed that. We put a magnet on, magnet on. It a paced, it v paced, it a paced, and when it a paced, it captured a. But yeah, absolutely, you want to work that out. You want to check that. Out. But this patient is in really decompensated heart failure. He's not well, and uh, and uh, my colleague was like, "What is going on with this ECG?" This, this, yeah, there's spikes on the T wave, right? That, like that should be scary, right? You should be scared of that, right? Yeah. If you're putting spikes on top of T waves, VT. you might induce VTVF. Right. Yeah, it's not good, right? Okay. Where is this spike coming from? Which which lead? I think this is atrial lead. Who said atrial lead? This is this is the, the atrial pacing spike. Okay. This is the A pacing spike, and this is the patient's intrinsic conduction. So, this is A pace conducts to V, 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 A pace conducts to V. Okay, that's quite a long first degree heart block, yeah? <laughs> Extreme A first degree AV block, which can cause significant heart failure symptoms, right? Okay? What's the, so the limit on VIP, we wouldn't let it go much above, this isn't a VIP device, this is someone else's device. Um, there are limits to which we would allow you to go. There are some, there are some algorithms that have no limits. Okay? So, as long as the A comes to the V, the A comes to the V, 
as long as you want, okay? All right? So we limit, you know, we were talking about the 300 milliseconds or 280 milliseconds as a limit. That's probably not unreasonable because they had programmed the, the, the V pacing suppression algorithm in this device <coughs> to prevent heart failure from not getting RV pacing and they caused heart failure, which is unhelpful, right? You really, you really don't need this, right? Okay, so what do we do with this patient? Tell them the program, the AV delays to a normal and then commit to RV pacing. What you could consider doing if the patient has a, yeah, upgrade to a CRT, right? You could consider that if you, um, if this patient has a, you know, a damaged um, left ventricle and, or even just, you could just, like a block HF type patient, right, with a not so damaged um, uh, uh, LV function. So watch out, super long AV delays, there's a tipping point, right? This is well past the tipping point. This is like a day past the tipping point, okay, of, uh, of, um, of uh, benefit, okay. Okay, here's another one. This is a. This has got a. This this one's got a stupid word in it. So you'll see. We'll see how we get on. A pace V sense VIP long AV delay. Okay, no retrograde conduction. We're all good. A pace is that definitely capturing the A? Yeah. It, okay. It doesn't look like it, does it? It's a flat line. Remember what I said about shrinkies? It shrinks. It goes like that. Some, sometimes there's deflection of the line. Yeah, sometimes, but, but the key point is when I actually pace, does a ventricular event happen? Every time, yeah. with the same interval. So it's capturing the A, right? So that captured it because it went here, that captured it because it went here. What's that? PVC, what's that? Retrograde? Far field, far field. Far field, whoa, we've got two things here. Retrograde, far field. How about just a P wave? It's just a P wave. Just a normal P wave. It's too short to be retrograde conduction, probably, right? This is a patient who has long retrograde block, okay? If you have a really short retrograde block like that, that will be a unicorn, okay? <laughs> You're looking for unicorns, some of you. Okay, go on. Yeah. This is a atrial beat, this one? Yeah, P-wave, sinus beat. So we paste here, and then it, it, the atrial... Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Then the atrial just because it was delayed. The, the atrial pace was delayed by the PVC. So when the PVC happens, the device doesn't actually pace. It resets the low rate timer. So now we have more time. Then sinus node goes boom and beeps. Okay. So the sinus node fires here. Okay. It doesn't see it, does it? The device doesn't. The dust device does see it. It's in the P VARP. Okay. Then we a pace conductor V. A pace conductor V. Then what happens? What is this here? Do we capture the A? Yeah. Some say no. Why wouldn't we capture the A? You You've been capturing it all the way along here. Yes. That'd be a unicorn. I you that you didn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they but it's definitely captured, yeah? A, V, A to V, A to V, A going through to V. So it's a, this is a PVC. So this is a A pace and it captured. Did capture, almost 100% likely to capture. It'd be weird if the threshold just suddenly changed on one beat, okay? Because this voltage here is three volts, or two and a half volts, and the, and the, 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 the output's two and a half volts, and the threshold's one, right? So it'd be weird if that lost. This is then a PVC, okay? So this, an A pace on top of a PVC has a special name. This is the, this is a stupid, this has a stupid name. This is called a pseudo pseudo fusion beat. A false, false fusion, okay? Yeah? So it's a pacing spike on top of a PVC. But it's an atrial pacing spike, not a ventricular pacing spike. Because if you get a V pace on a PVC, that's called a pseudo fusion. So a pseudo pseudo fusion is a false, false fusion. Okay? I don't even make that up, that's a real thing, okay? So that's a false, false fusion. And then what's happened to the ventricular electrodes? The ventricular signal? You can't see it, can you? It hasn't seen. The ventricular lead has not sensed this signal. Because it, yeah, absolutely. Because this is in this is in ventricular blanking. Yeah. So when you actually pace, and only when you actually pace, you blank the ventricle. Because this is uh, the maybe three volts, and next door in the ventricle, we're trying to detect something down as low as two millivolts. So that's thousands of times smaller. So we have to hide 
we have to blind the ventricular channel for a short period of time. So we blank this, Apex blanks the V, pseudo pseudo fusion B. What's the device, what time is like what's happening now? The device is doing its, uh, it's running its AV delay, look. And it's an AV delay of 400 milliseconds because it's VIP and aggressive settings, okay? So Apex capture, it blocks, the intrinsic blocks from the AV, it hits the PVC, blocks. We V pace, V capture, retrograde conduction. Okay? Because we're, this V pace is, is 200, 400 milliseconds away from when we last actually captured, right? So off we go to PMT. So how are we going to fix this one? It could be a VIP problem. It could be a VIP problem. The, the trigger here, the problem here, is the PVC. PVC is the intrinsic problem. Because if the PVC hadn't happened, this wouldn't have triggered, would it? Right? Because it's the blanking of the PVC that's the problem. The VIP adds to the problem. Okay? So it's like a so this is like a forest fire starting. If I just have if I have a match in a forest, I probably can't start a fire. If I have a match and petrol, now I can start a fire in a forest. Okay? So so this is the match, this is the match, or this is this is the match, this is the petrol, this is the fire. Okay? You need a few things. Take one out, it just doesn't happen. Okay? Take the PVC out, which you can't do. Or the PVC happens here, it's not a problem. It's just a really well-timed PVC. It's surprisingly common how often they time up though with, uh, with A pacing. So you A pace, blank the V, trigger stuff like this here, okay? And, anyway, and then it, it stopped it, as usual. The, the algorithm kicked it, stopped it. Okay, it's enough PMTs, I think. I've done quite a lot of PMTs, right? So, so all the different causes of PMTs, um, there are lots of different tyres and there are different um, mechanisms that you can use to fix it. Okay, so this is a, um, this is a case of, this is a case that sometimes causes people some level of anxiety, right? Or what we're gonna go through, some level of anxiety. Do you ever see a pace in, you ever, I guess, guys, are, are you following up pacemakers sometimes? Yeah. Do you see them in clinic? Okay. So you, have, you know you follow up a pacemaker patient and uh, you see him in a clinic and then you're looking at him going, you look and thinking, how long has this battery got? Has it got a year or six months or two years? When shall I see them next in clinic? Because they live a long way away and they find it hard to get here. Uh, should I have them change it? Should I send them away for a year, six months, right? That causes people anxiety, right? Uh, it's, it's tricky, right? Because you don't want to send them away and then the pacemaker to die and then there's a problem, right? So this is a little bit about that. So I'm going to get you to predict when to replace the battery, okay? So this is a pacemaker that was put in in 2006. 100% pacing, one volt, one milliseconds with an impedance of 300 ohms, okay? Quite low impedance, but it's stable and low, so there's no compromise on the leak, okay? So this, um, I got involved with this patient last year. So here is a here is a printout of the battery on someone's finger from 2013, the 7th of November 2013, okay? Remember when was this put in? This was put in in uh, 2006. So it's seven years old, okay? Seven and a bit years old. So seven and a bit years old, battery voltage is 2.72, remaining longevity is five and a half, magnet rate is 96, and penis is 1.3 kilo ohms, battery. Just the battery information we're looking at, interested in, okay? All right, magnet rate, what's magnet rate? Magnet rate is, just a way of measuring the battery voltage if you don't have a programmer, okay? People, some people write on the follow-up form the battery voltage and then the magnet rate. Well, you've just written the same thing, yeah? It's like writing, I don't know, 60 miles an hour and, you know, 100 kilometers an hour. It's the same thing with a different measurement. You don't need both, you just need one, okay? All right, but if you don't have a programmer, putting a magnet on will tell you what the battery voltage is at, okay? So battery voltage 2.72, remaining longevity, and 1.3 kilo ohms. When do you want to see this patient next? By the way, he's 100% ventricular pacing. He has no underlying rhythm whatsoever. You turn the pacemaker off, his heart stops. Six months? Six months? Yeah. Anyone got longer? He lives miles away, he lives like 50 miles away. It takes him a really long time to get here. A year? So some people go for a year? Okay, so send them away for, they sent them away for a year. So he comes back in uh, 2014, 6th of November 2014. Battery voltage has gone up. What? Hang on, let's go back. Yeah, battery voltage has definitely gone up. This is crazy. 
what this guy is a unicorn. No, it's not a unicorn. It's not. It's a donkey. Uh, Vashay Fort has just gone up. Romanian longevity is still five, five and a half years. Magnavate is we ignore because it's this. Penis is 1.7. Penis, penis, battery of penis has gone up by 0 0.4. But this is normal. Yeah, it's normal. So the battery of penis is the as it as the battery is being used. The battery impedance starts to, the resistance to the battery starts to build up because it's basically the side product of the reaction between the lithium and the iodine, okay? So this is a lithium, this is important, this is a lithium iodine chemistry battery, okay? Okay, so um, when do you want to see it? Why is, why is the battery voltage? This is crazy. Battery voltage has gone up. This is normal. It, so the battery voltage is a measurement of the load on the battery at the time. Okay, so I can make this go, I can make this number go to 2, 1 point something, and then a minute later, 2.8. Okay, if you put a huge load on it, it will drop, okay? So when the device makes this measurement, it kind of depends what load is on the battery at the time, okay? So, uh, and then let me just ask you a question, because this, what, 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 what do you, what's this, what do you call this? That, that thing there, that bar. So some people call it a fuel gauge, a gas gauge. No, no, call it that. The battery voltage. Battery. So, so you, know, you know, when you're telephones, you see the battery and it comes down and down and down and down and down and down, and then you can't send WhatsApp messages anymore, right? That. It looks a bit like that, doesn't it? Yeah. So people treat it like their battery gauge on their on their phone or the fuel gauge on the car, right? Don't do it. Not with a lithium iodine chemistry. It doesn't behave like the battery gauge on your phone. It, beha it behaves completely differently, as we're going to see in a minute. Okay? This is a this is a voltage gauge. Okay? So on a lithium iodine chemistry battery, it's a voltage gauge. How do you know it's a voltage gauge? Because it says volts on it. Okay? It doesn't say time. Time. It says voltage. Okay? So we need to be just a little bit, um, just just remember that. Okay. So when do we? Oh, when are we going to see this patient? This is 2014. When do we want to see him? A year. A year. Yeah. See him a year. When do you want to see him? You say you want to take his box out. Give him a new pacemaker. You think I'm setting the trap up, don't you? Me. Will I set traps up? Yes, probably. <laughs> okay. This is one year later, 2015. Battery voltage is unchanged. Yeah. It's no problem. Um, Four years remaining longevity. Yeah, going forever. This pacemaker. This is a nuclear pacemaker. It's not really. Battery and is 2.4 kilo ohms. When do we want to see this patient? Um, a year. Another year. Must be sent back. It's 2015. We're getting nearer to today, so I might tell you slightly something. Oh, hang on. I don't know why the bottom bit's knocked off, but it doesn't matter. This is now 2016. So he keeps coming back early November, right? Maybe he's due next week, we'll see. This week. Battery voltage is 2.69, remaining longevity is 2.5 to 3 years. ERI in this is 2.5, yeah? Right, it's 2.7. So in the last however many years, it's dropped by 0. Point nothing of a volt, okay? This is good, right? Battery of is 4.1. When do you want to see him? No. One year's not going to work. Six months? Six months? Yeah. Six. Three to six months. Three to six months. Anyone want to go for a year? No. Can you take us for a year? I feel like doing an auction. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they sent them away for a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how he came back. Wow. His battery is nearly empty. No, well, no, I, I, battery, no. 30, I seen it. battery is 30 kilograms. 30 kilograms, okay? Yeah. So this is this is this is very close to being dead. 2.2, we would classify as end of service. <laughs> that's when the device might start to act a little bit erratic. Okay, still working, um, still working, but it's really quite dead. Um, this is this is an emergency admission change box, pretty damn quickly. Okay, so the the key, the key things to think about are that this, this thing here, this is a voltage curve and it does not behave linearly. 
Okay, remember this device was put in, this device was made in 2006, a long time ago. Okay, so, and uh, the, the, this remaining longevity is, in, is a very, this is a really rough estimate, okay? Okay, it can sometimes predict, so here, two and a half to five, three years. So the person who's followed this up looked at this number and went, excellent, send them away for a year, no problem. What they should be looking at, and this is specific to lithium iodine chemistry, right? You should be looking at this number. When this number gets to sort of four to five kilo ohms, the best thing to do is to send this data here to technical services. One of the guys, get their emails, send it to them. They'll send it to the person in Sweden with the enormous brain and they order a computer and they will tell you exactly how long that device. And then you don't have to think about it. Then you don't have to worry too much about it, okay? But when you get to four or five kilo ohms, you need to be intensifying follow-ups of these uh, lithium iodine chemistry batteries, okay? Otherwise, um, mistakes like this can be made. If this patient had been another two weeks, this might be a very, uh, a very different outcome, okay? So there's a little bit of text here. People in the, people in the UK call it a fuel gauge. Shouldn't, shouldn't the pacemaker be uh, in VO or more? Uh, no, 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 it will remain in VBI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. VBI, so that's uh, it, it will remain VBI as long as, it, as long as it can. If it gets really bad, it starts to do stuff that we don't really want it to do. It starts to get a bit erratic, potentially. And when it is interrogatable, the battery? At, at that point it is. At a, at a certain point it will be uninterrogatable. So when it gets below about 2.2, you might not be able to talk to it anymore. Which reading is important to evaluate your battery on Yeah. Is it the battery voltage or the impedance? Which one is the alarm? The one that alerts, the one that, the one that the device uses to trigger ERI is battery voltage. Yeah, but for you? But for me, as a, as a human, I'm looking at this and this. Okay. I'm looking at both of these here, but I'm particularly looking at the battery impedance. I'm also looking at how much the patient paces. If they pace like 5% of the time in a four kilo ohms, I'm not too bothered, right? I'm not, I'm not worried, right? So it's just, it, it depends. This guy's 100% pacing. Four <laughs> kilo ohms, he's got a problem. So the impedance reflects the state of the battery? The, the impedance, yeah. The impedance reflects the, the rubbish that is generated from the lithium iodine chemistry, yeah. So. And this, this, the, the other thing that confuses people, with, and this is with our older generation, new generation is different, I'll show you new generation in a minute. Um, this curve, this, this thing here is a voltage curve, a voltage gauge, right? And it's not linear, it's not time, right? Time is linear, right? Voltage decline is not linear, it accelerates, and it accelerates very quickly. So it goes like this, it's, well it's like you're driving along in your car, right? And your car's full of petrol, you're driving along and you've got like, you know, 100 miles to go, you look at your fuel gauge, fuel gauge is nearly full, and then in another 10 minutes you look at your fuel gauge and it's empty. And you're like, well why did that happen? Okay, because it goes like this, it goes, it goes gradual, 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 bang. Okay? Because it's not a time gauge, it's a voltage gauge. And I know, we, know that's, we know that's confusing now, but back in 2006, when no, no, you know, everybody didn't have all this sort of mobile phones and we're looking at battery gauges, now we look at battery gauges every day and we'll follow that thing down, so now we think that that's the same thing, okay? With our current devices, the new pacemakers, I'm sure the stuff you're putting in today, it's a, it's a time gauge, so it is linear, okay? Does that make sense? I'll show you what, I'll show you what that looks like, connect, connect through to the program. Now. This is what a voltage gauge, this is what voltage does on pacemaker. It goes on lithium iodine chemistry, right? It goes like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, bang. So you're trying to pick up the ERI before it goes vertical. This guy was, you know, he was here. He's on a straight line to somewhere, if he's not careful. And, they, um, and this is what the resistance, so the resistance at the beginning of life is low, and then the reaction between the lithium and the iodine gradually builds up this impedance. This is a very old battery now. It's, 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 it's aged, right? It's been well used. It's got, you know, it's starting to get old. And so this is one kilo ohm. It's not, it's not that old, sorry. Then this here is really old. So, I'm, uh, you know, um, 20 sort of kilo ohms. So 10 kilo ohms and 20 kilo ohms. You know, round about five, you want to start intensifying follow-up if they've got decent amounts of pacing and stuff like that, okay? So this is our older generation. Battery voltage does this. Battery impedance does this, okay? Yeah, so once the battery impedance starts to move, you're, going, you're heading towards a kind of vertical slope, okay? So you just need to 
just keep a very, very close eye on it. Like I said, if you're ever in question, email addresses, you can send it to them, or even you can get our direct uh, email address that I'm sure I've ever shared over the, the technical services in Sweden, and you can just you send them the battery data, and they'll come back to you within an hour and tell you tell you how long that device has got. Okay, it's it's available to anyone. You just hit an email to these guys, and they'll they'll, they'll give you it. So, just to quickly show you the difference, the difference with modern devices, newer devices. Um, so this device uses a different, a different battery chemistry. It uses a battery chemistry called quasar medium rate, which is lithium, silver, vanadium, carbon monofluoride oxide uh, battery chemistry versus, yeah, yeah, I could have made most of that up, but I, I, that's actually true, versus lithium iodine, right? So QMR technology, that's why I call it QMR, right? Because it's easier to say, people believe it, um, is uses Here's the battery gauge on a, on a QMR device, and it, it's time, okay? So this is linear. The way to tell a QMR device from a lithium iodine device with ABAP is what this gauge is made out of. If the gauge is time, it's QMR. If the gauge is voltage, it's lithium iodine. Um, and then the, the, other, the other thing you get that's different is um, you don't, the curves are a bit different, the battery curves are a little bit different, but also on a QMR device, you will not get an impedance. There's no battery impedance because the battery impedance doesn't change very much. There's very little change in battery impedance over the lifetime, so it's not a good indicator. Okay? All right. So you can trust this number, but I remember with the lithium ID, the numbers are a bit sketchy. It's, it's, it's because in the older devices it used battery voltage as a predictor of end, or as a as a as a um, as a time measurement, and as you know, it goes tick 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 bang. Okay. So there is a point where you could be saying a high voltage, but you're just about to start dropping, so that higher voltage e equals a long longevity, and then you don't have to move very much for it to go, and then the time to drop off, okay? Yeah? So just be uh, be cautious of that. Same with everybody, so, so Medtronic's and everybody else's lithium ID behaves exactly the same. Next bit is going to be one. So we've got ICDs tomorrow. So I was going to um, finish off the rest of the day just on on uh, CRT and um, just talking through um, specifically how to get the most out of a CRT device. Okay. So how how to consider optimizing a CRT device. All right. Do, do are any of you guys optimize the CRT devices? And how are you optimizing? What do you do? Sometimes uh, we use echo guided optimization. Okay. Optimizing the VV delay and the yep. AV delay. Okay. Sometimes we are ECG guided. Okay. Just about the, the width. Yeah. Which do you prefer? Which do you think is the most accurate? I believe the echo guided. Okay. Okay. Some people think echoes voodoo. <laughs> So and it goes, it goes t tricky, right? You're on the table in, a, in, a, in the implant, and uh, you've not got an echo machine, right? No, no, we do it after. Oh, do afterwards. Okay. So sometimes so, Doppler. Sometimes. Pardon? Doppler. And sometimes Doppler. Uh, yeah, yeah, Doppler. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so, so Abbott are we've we've been using some um, uh, electrical optimization techniques, just straightforward ECG techniques to try to get the best uh, the best and the best possible outcome for the patient, right? So, so this is optimizing electrically at implant, on the table, before they get off the table. It takes five minutes, okay? That then might give your patient, and I think there's, there's reasonably good evidence, no, there's good evidence, to suggest that if you narrow the QRS, enough, if you narrow the QRS, will equal, there's a nice big meta-analysis done it, will equal better clinical outcome, okay? The, the, the evidence exists. So you do that, so this is a strategy that, that some of our hospitals are employing now with our help. You do that at implant, and then your, chan your, op your need to potentially echo optimize them as a non-responder probably goes down, okay? They should do better, okay? So I'm just gonna walk through it with, uh, with, a, um, with a couple of cases, actually, just, just a couple of real-life cases. 